all of her thoughts on what she has learned with being the historian of our community here. So uh, welcome to you all, and we do have our little magic can in the back, just in case anybody feels like a dollar or two to drop in the can, because um, we all do this just for ourselves, and we then turn around and give the community center this pot that you've brought in and given to us with passing the the uh, can around. So the can is back there, and so that will go to the community center for letting us have the building. And then if everybody will help move their chair to the back after we have our, our completed wonderful lecture here, or not lecture, but all these tales that she's going to tell us. <laughs> so anyway, thanks for coming. And like if I say, if you could all help us with our chairs, I'd appreciate it too. So have a good evening. Uh, uh, well, thank, you. thank you so very much. Now I have to. <laughs> However, you just hold it, Barb. Um, okay. Well, you see, this should now this should now start recording. Christine, you want the light off? At once, I get things working. And if they don't work, they will just. Okay, well, we'll just. What I need is one more piece of equipment, right? <laughs> uh, if you would turn those off, that would be great, Tom. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back. We, we meet again. Uh, we did this last month for Jewish merchants, and I had a couple of things to, uh, as a continuation from that. You may have remembered that Morris Tischler belonged to something called the 40 Liars Club, and we couldn't figure out what that was, and thank you, Tom Elliott, for figuring out that it had to do with a book that was published uh, um, in the 1880s called the 40 Liars Club. Is it not working? Does it need to start or I, I punched it. Oh, okay. It should say on the top that it's the, the recording. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this, is good. this will be one of those videos that will be like the start of Zoom. Remember when we were all doing Zoom? Yes. Okay. You're on mute. <laughs> so here we are. Um, we did record the last one, by the way. Uh, the library district. Thank you, Libby. Uh, hey, thank you, Ocean, for helping me figure this out earlier today. And thanks, Pinky, for getting things to, to balance. Mm -hmm. uh, but so back to last one. The Forty Liars Club had to do with a book called The Forty Liars Club by Bill Nye. Um, and I'm sure that's where the title came from. Was then, it local? No, no. Uh, it was a very popular book, national publication. And then Pauline Marshall mentioned the Kobe family over in Aspen and said, what? that she remembered them having to do with potato chips. Well, they're still in the potato <coughs> chip business, except it's potato sticks. And then I found an additional Jewish family in Silver Plume called the Mecklenburgs, and I'll tell you a little more about them, but I'm assuming that they were Jewish. It was a couple both born in Poland, and he was a dry goods merchant, so pretty good chance. Anyway, good evening. <laughs> Here we are. Uh, I'm going to come over here so you don't see me doing this. Um, I think this is the first time we've done a separate program on Silver Plume. So this is kind of fun. I'm going to try, I'm going to give one more try to getting the, um, to get the recorder to work. Come on, little guy, you should be happy. You worked at home. That's Christine, fine. you want some help? I have a helper here. You have a helper here? Are you familiar with he this? Can. No, but no, but he's an IT guy. So what it is is normally well, it could be. <laughs> see, this um, is plugged in over here. Where the, the machine is on. Yeah, and then this where it says microphone should be the recording. Let me hold it down because I'm just an impatient person. Sometimes that will do it. Now, okay. We're recording it on, on this, so that's that's what <laughs> 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 Remember when we used to just read papers? <laughs> okay. Anyway, I think this may be the first time.
time, it's the first time I've done a Silver Plume presentation, so, and it's been kind of fun. Silver Plume was a little harder to research, because the photo, there aren't as many photographs as there are in Georgetown when you're researching and researching buildings. Everybody took pictures up on Leavenworth Mountain. So you have pictures of the whole town and you can kind of judge by year what's happening. A little harder in Silver Plume, but we will we'll start and go through. Okay. One more guy, there you go. This is the oldest picture that I've seen of Silver Plume. And uh, actually, thanks to John Wilson, the Fiddler John, because he had contacted me and asked about Silver City, because the way this is identified at Denver Public Library, it says it's a photograph of Silver City. Silver City would have been up above Alice. This is Silver Plume. <laughs> you can certainly tell with, that's the, the bull's head there. And I think this is taken probably 1869 or 1870. Silver Plume um, starts, of course, with more of the silver phase, silver mining phase of Colorado history more than gold mining. So think back 1859, you've got George Jackson and John Gregory coming up with gold mining. You have the Griffith brothers coming up to Georgetown and attempting to find gold. And a later reporter would say it was a little hard because they were looking for gold in silver mines. <laughs> so once you make the turn, at Empire Junction start coming up this way, you're into more predominantly silver mines. There, it, there's gold here, um, more discovered or more developed in the 20th century, but the real bonanza up here was going to be silver. I've always enjoyed the fact that the, the first discovery of high, high quality silver was up on the ridge line of Mount McClellan. Been to Waldorf and look up at the ridge up where the Argentine Central went and stopped up in that vicinity. That was the discovery of the Belmont Lode, and it was very rich. So that was 1864, the fall of 64. So in 1865, people are coming up. 1866, they start to believe and start doing some early construction. In Georgetown, in my end of town down here, um, there were 1860s houses built. But at that point in time, see, I love the fact, as I started to say, I love the fact they go all the way up to Waldorf, we call it, up above that, and they're running right <coughs> past Silver Plume and Silverdale, which were much easier to get to and had really good high-grade deposits of ore. But Silver Plume as a community, um, actually just the buildings themselves, don't start to show up until about 1869 or 1870. And uh, that's why I think this is about that time period. In eight, an 1872 article says, Silver Plume, up the principal tributary of Clear Creek about three miles, the beautiful valley surrounded by gigantic spurs of the main range, nestling in this mountain park. This has got to be Stephen Decatur writing this. Nobody else writes this way. He's also the one who named Silver Plume, by the way. One of the most delightful spots in this picturesque land of mountain and valley is now growing, thrifty and pleasant town of Silver Plume. In 1869, one of the sturdy pioneers and miners of this district, Charles A. Kimberlin, and his associate, Colonel Ambrose H. Bartlett of Donovan County, Kansas, conceived the idea of founding a city in this beautiful valley. A somewhat gigantic enterprise, the reader will think, but the inceptive movements of founding cities in remote mining districts are not a ten, oh, he's, he's a little worried here. Um, so, we visited this town a few days since and noted the following business establishments, all seemingly doing a good paying business with trade consistent, constantly increasing. Uh, Daily and D, General Merchandise, uh, Messrs. Strauss and Sprague, we talked about them last month, branch of the Georgetown House, dry goods and clothing, also in their old building on Main Street, Bridges and Adams, fruit, cigars, and tobacco on Main Street. O'Connor Brothers Livery Stable. There are three good boarding houses already in operation. Before winter closes in, two large hotels will be erected. There's also, of course, construction, a large store building, uh, property of Messer, Spruance, and Love. And this is where I have to say, Love is Joseph Love. He built the Courier Building down here, and he's also my great-great-great 
uncle. So it's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, who knew? Um, okay. In addition to these improvements, Messrs. Kimber, Kimberlin and Bartlett are constructing storerooms and dwelling houses in different parts of town. Many new citizens are erecting comfortable houses along the beautiful level streets. Level streets. <laughs> <laughs> um, Messrs. Kimberlin and Bartlett have had the town site surveyed and mapped and have taken measures to have proper municipal authorities and all the usual regulations of Colorado villages. Okay, so they say this is very early. This is going to be, so uh, this would be where Big Town Hall is right now. Oh, wow. Okay, so you're coming in here, and that's Main Street. Then this is going to be probably more like 1872. Um, they're talking about other things being built in the 72 article that aren't here yet. One of the ways of dating photos tends to be the receding timber lines. <laughs> you notice that. Uh, and then in Silver Plume, it also can be the growth of the mine notes, which is still pretty tiny at this point in time. This is. Um, you'd be standing about in front of Big Town Hall and Silver Plume looking east at this point. Oh, wait, wait, go back. I know, I want you to go back. I can. Okay, so this is, yeah, there's a lot of buildings here. And you can tell that they are all wooden construction, which is going to create a problem in a couple more years. Um, this is where Big Town Hall now sits. And you can tell it's very similar to Big Town Hall. Uh, it's going to disappear in 1884 and then <coughs> pop back up. But um, all of these buildings, they're huge. So we have here number one, I think, is a Cornish building with uh, Mr. Bader Lamina's saloon. There are a lot of saloons in this stretch. <laughs> Egan Hall here. Um, this, so Sop and Truscott would be on this corner, okay, on today's. So Egan Hall, Wayland Saloon, and Rosenberg Saloon. The Dobson House is up here. It's giant. Uh, Ganley and Company's Grocery would be where uh, Sop and Truscott is now. This is Henry Schanowski's residence. I just like his name. I used to know somebody named Henry Schanowski. This was Clare Hall, also home of the Knights of Pythia, so KP Hall. And this big one is the Screen Block or, and Mrs. Screen's Bakery. Um, you can see they're starting to put in the 730 Road here. So I'm thinking this is late 1870s, maybe 1880. It's really hard to date silver plume photographs. First of all, as I say, there aren't a huge number of them. But they're all the, the tax records are kind of iffy because well, Silver Plume incorporates in 1875. Aha, uh -huh. those of you who go on the train August 19th every year might say, no, no, it incorporates 1880. Well, they disincorporated. <laughs> so they incorporated in 1875. And if you remember George Downing's melodrama, he had one where they're going, incorporate, freedom is great, incorporate. So they incorporated, then they decided they didn't like it, so they disincorporated. <laughs> and they reincorporated in 1880. But they, that means they have two town plats. So the blocks and lots are different, just to make it special fun. And the only thing that they platted was the central downtown area. So a lot of the property descriptions for the early buildings are House on Creek. Thank you. Anyway, we'll get it pulled together. But this is. And then this one. Now, the other thing, if you do much with Silver Plume history, George Rowe, and George Rowe saved everything, which is great. He also wrote on everything, but it's okay. Because what he ends up doing is telling us that um, this is, again, before the fire. Uh, he has the railroad grade showing here with 1883. It could be a little earlier than that. But again, look at how compact all of these buildings are because they're going through these. Um, <laughs> This is good for, it doesn't show the picture as well, but so we have 
Egan Hall, which we had just seen from the backside over here, um, and the Wayland and Rosenberg <coughs> saloons. These are three saloons here. Then we get to Mr. Mecklenburg's dry goods. Number three over here is the Pelican House. Uh, four is Morgenthau's dry goods. Five is an empty building, which is now where Silver Street goes through. Um, yeah. <clears throat> this large building here, it was the Foresters Hall, Post Office, and Watson Store. Uh, the Catholic <coughs> Church and the City Hotel, and the Dobson Hotel over here again. That's a three-story building. It's, mm -hmm. it's considerable. On this one, just to, uh, this is the one view, the more normal view. You do get a silver plume. And again, George Rowe writing on pictures, but he, he can at least tell us this shows you where Silver Street comes through. And this building um, was sitting through what was later flatted as, uh, as Silver Street, Diamond Tunnel, and the others here. And another view here, you can see that they're putting the grain in here. So this one, about 1883. So this is going to be, uh, let's see, there. and again, looking down, looking down Main Street. Now these gentlemen are part of the Silver Plume Hook and Ladder Company number one. And in 1882, Silver Plume forms a hook and ladder company and they attempt to gain, gather the funds to buy a hook and ladder uh, truck. With that three-story building that you just saw, the Dobson House, you can understand why they would want to have hooks and ladders. To my knowledge, they were never able to acquire enough money to do that. But they were apparently good competitors because this running team for the Hook and Ladder Company did win the 4th of July uh, contest in Georgetown. But the problem was, the problem was that there were all of those tightly packed in um, buildings that were wooden structures and the fact that they did not have any piped water and they did not have um, a, an engine at this time. So in November of 1884, there's a pretty major problem. The thriving little town of Silver Plume yesterday, happy and prosperous, is today a mass of ruins and ashes. In a few brief hours, there disappeared about 50 beautiful little residences and substantial business houses in which were invested, in many cases, the earnings of a lifetime of toil. Men, women, and children are cast upon the world today, destitute of all but scant clothing worn upon their bodies, having neither home nor money. About one o'clock this morning, while the citizens of our neighboring town, this was written by the Georgetown Courier, citizens of our neighboring town were reposing Unconscious of the terrible calamity destined to visit them, they were awakened by exciting cries of fire. It was discovered that flames were issuing from the rear of the saloon run by Sam DeMott, which would have been right about here. Um, on the corner of Main and Charles Streets. Efforts were made to quench the fire, but the elements had gained the mastery of the situation and began to spread rapidly. Adjacent buildings were soon ignited. The vast volume of smoke, gigantic crackling flames, and shooting sparks convinced the citizens that a gate conflagration was upon them. Members of the Silver Plume Book and Ladder Company were soon at work, but their efforts were fruitless. Everybody realized the town's helplessness in battling such a monster without waterworks, fire engine, or hose company. So Georgetown, Georgetown uh, it gets waterworks in 1874, and that's because Albert Forbes who had the, his business uh, at, at the uh, Cushman Block, heard of the fire in Central City and just closed his business and set about forming a private waterworks company. But in Georgetown, it's a little easier to get water from the creek through town because things are closer. Think about Silver Plume, and the creek is, you know, the creek's over here, and the waterworks finally end up all the way up here. So you're a long way from, from water. Messenger was finally dispatched to Georgetown. Fire bells immediately brought our firemen together. Starhook and Ladder Company's truck, drawn by four horses, soon afterwards arrived upon the scene. In the meantime, the destroyer was marching west on Main Street, devouring in its path the buildings on each side of the street after having laid low the residences and business houses. 
in the vicinity where the fire orig originated, including the Coloradoan office. So by this time, there was a Silver Plume newspaper called the Silver Plume Coloradoan. Its office was right about in here. It was um, Jesse Randall's father who was in charge of it. So um, I digress. The conflagration had reached almost to the creek, but that's going to be the creek up here. In today's parlance would be past the post office where the creek comes up to Main Street there. Mm -hmm. So it had almost reached the creek and threatened to cross and strike terror to the inhabitants of the southern end of town. Uh, flames were also consuming the hotel next to the Catholic Church. The Dobson House was a mass of flames. Egan and Cornish's Falls were both beds of coal. The scene was exciting and affecting. Uh, men whose little fortunes had disappeared in the smoking morning were desperately running here and there. Crowds were rescuing goods from burning stores. Teams and wagons were conveying them to places of safety. Citizens were heroically following the fiery serpent, which hissed defiance in its terrible work. Women and children were clinging to each other in fright. Uh, so they then, um, oh, I was going to skip something here. The noble rescuers to whom the Silver Plume citizens are indebted, and that's the Georgetown Fire Department for saving the western section of town. When the hand fire engine from Georgetown, accompanied by a hose cart, was driven into the unfortunate village, the citizens became hopeful. In a few minutes, the course of the flames was checked and further discussion, this destruction prevented. Uh, then there's a, a thank you from the town of Silver Plume. And there's a note in the Silver Plume, Colorado, and that resumes publication. Silver Plume had the fastest team at the county tournament in Georgetown, but when it comes to a fire, the Georgetown Laddies far excel us, but that's because we have no apparatus to work with. And at that point in time, then people are starting to rebuild. And they say they're going to rebuild in with brick, but they really don't at this point in time. These are the buildings that were destroyed. <laughs> uh, so starting from the end of the street where we were just looking with that picture, there was the Corral Stables, the Shea Residence, the Lumber Yard, the Mott Saloon, an empty building, the Screen Block, and Mrs. Screen's Bakery, which was that big dark colored building at the end of the street, empty building, Samson's Meat Market, Grocery, then we get Wayland's Saloon, Egan's Hall, Rosenberg Saloon, Boyle and Jennings Saloon, Gilmartin's <laughs> Saloon, Henry Shaw, Upsonowski's Saloon. So if you're walking down Main Street towards Big Town Hall and you find yourself craving a beer, you yeah, know, it's the spirits, what can I say? Mecklenburg's uh, Dry Goods, a meat market, Morgenthau's Dry Goods, a vacant building in Silver Street, Monday's Dry Goods, which is where uh, the registers live now, Forrester's Hall, Thomas Grocery, and Wesley Residence torn down coming across the street, another building torn down. So what they had decided to do was to tear buildings down to make sure they could stop the flames. Mm -hmm. Then the Catholic Church saved. And of course, the local history does talk about Grandma Buckley um, praying on the steps of the church to save it. And you know, mm hey, -hmm. combination of a little prayer and the, and the fire department certainly helped. Then the city hotel. Shoe shop, Chinaman's Cabin, I did not know that had been there. Roberts Brothers Barbershop, Roberts Pelican House. So anyway, all of these, all of these buildings were um, taken out in the fire. So then, so then they do start to rebuild. And you can see that when they do rebuild, they leave Silver Street here open. And they've talked about rebuilding in brick, but they don't. Uh, and these are a couple of new wooden structures. This is where Nick and Alana live now. This is uh, Big Town Hall. And I think this next one will show it. You can see that the dumps are increasing in size. Um, OK. No, that's too soon. Oh, wait, it's not. I know, down is up and up is down on this. OK. So. You have this and you still have some wooden buildings. So in 1884, Silver Plume does get a pumper. They still have the pumper up at the museum. And that makes things a lot safer. So 
Um, but in what year are we? 1886, what might what might have been a disastrous conflagration broke out about 10:30 Tuesday night at Mrs. Margaret Feenan's hotel and boarding house. And I think that's up here. I think that's where the Jaybleys are now, where the Rizardis were. The fire started in a sleeping apartment. As an alarm was given, Willingham soon had the fire engine and hose cart. Engine was run to the creek, and after a hard pull up Main Street, you better believe it, uh, <laughs> thence up Silver Street to the burning <clears throat> building with the hose, nozzle was attached with some difficulty as water was already being forced up from the engine. But can you imagine, so the creek is all the way down here, and you're running hose all the way up here and pumping it. You've seen the pumper, it's just a hand pump like this. Mm -hmm. And to get that to then get enough power to get water up that hill. But um, they were able to do that that year. So then, okay, so all's well, 1886. 1887, in ashes, Silver Plume's second big fire. Mm -hmm. Silver Plume seems destined to be forever set back or entirely wiped out by fire. Last Wednesday morning, about quarter past four, the building's owned by Mrs. Mary Egan. Um, and occupied by Pat Foley as a saloon, of course, uh, was discovered to be on fire. Citizens turned out in full force to battle another fire, which for a time promised to again destroy the business part of town. Foley's place was central in a row of three saloons, <laughs> and the fire, when first discovered, was behind the bar. Um, and the problem, and so at this point in time, the fire engine not being in proper order, oops, and no one seeming to understand the workings of the apparatus, oops. <laughs> About half an hour of valuable time was lost before any water could be got through the hose. They then, they're contacting so, uh, Georgetown. Georgetown starts to come up, but they figure it out and they're able to put the fire out. But they end up wiping out a lot of this area. <laughs> so then they rebuild and they're rebuilding in the stone buildings that are up there now. And that makes life a little safer. There's another view of showing you these stone buildings here. This is Olivia's. This is um, where the tea room was. And once again, Big Town Hall. Now I keep pointing out Big Town Hall because, <laughs> because some of you some of you hang out with me while I go, blah, 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 blah. I mean you go to coffee with me and you end up here as big channel. Um, <laughs> Claire's Hall was built by Mr. Claire before the fire. After the fire, he immediately starts to rebuild, and he rebuilds an identical building, you think? Well, George Rowe um, told people that that building was brought down from Brownville, and it wasn't. Uh, my dear friend George Downing told me, yes, it was. I said, no, it wasn't. He said, I've been underneath it. There's a, there's a stone wall behind it. And I said, yes, because they put on an addition. Mm -hmm. Well, I know because in the paper it says he's going to build, he is building, he's occupying, they're, they're putting on a, a dance. And then in the county records, there's a lien because <laughs> he didn't pay for all the lumber. And the lien describes for the building just built it. <clears throat> so anyway. This was built by Mr. Clare. So we're from history, there are, the oral history is wonderful, <laughs> but if you hear from someone, it's the source I can never compete with. If somebody says, George Rowe said, I, 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 you know, but in this case, I was talking to Dave Collins, and I was talking to Dave Collins and I said, you know, I think that building was built by William Clare. And he just looked at me and he said, well, I'll be darned. Jess Clare always said his dad built that building. Uh -huh. Yes. So I could say, well, Dave Collins said. <laughs> okay. Um, going back, I kind of skipped across uh, Charles Kimberlin, who was the one, Kimberlin and Bartlett, who were the ones who really start putting the town together back in 1870. And Mr. Kimberlin had a daughter named Maddie. Um, Kimberlin's wife died in 1873, and he hangs around for a little while, but then he's a prospector and he takes off, and his daughter, who would have been considered a half-orphan after his 
wife died, his daughter ends up staying with the Fenan family because uh, the Fenans had a daughter named Alice, and when Alice Griffin Fenan comes to Silver Plume about 1870, she's oh, eight years old, and she meets young Maddie Kimberlin, who's also eight years old. They become lifelong friends. Alice Griffin Fenan later becomes Mrs. Jeremiah Buckley, and for those of us hanging around Silver Plume these days, she was known later as Grandma Buckley. But they became friends and stayed friends forever. The two of them promised whoever um, died first, the other one would attend their funeral. And indeed, Grandma Buckley did uh, attend the funeral for Maddie Kimberlin. She married a gentleman named Carr, and they had ch three children, one of whom was named Ralph. You know who Ralph Carr is, folks? Oh, the governor. Yeah, Governor yeah. Carr. If you go downtown, the uh, state judicial building Governor Carr. So Governor Carr's grandfather was the one who's who's starting Silver Plume. But anyway. Okay. Where did I leave off? I digress. Brownville. Now, Brownville, Brownsville. <coughs> Both. Um, Brownville tends to be the more formal name. The school district <coughs> records are all Brownville, not with the S. The, um, the, the voting precinct and other things. But nonetheless, People called it Brownsville a lot. It was never incorporated, so there wasn't an official name. It's like Silverdale, one word or two. But um, this is Brownville, uh, this, uh, a portion of Brownville. Let me get you oriented here. See this rock? This rock outcropping is on the frontage road. As you go out of Silver Plume and you go underneath I-70 mm -hmm. and go up, the frontage road now comes about in here. So all of these buildings are on the south side of the creek. It's just kind of cool. Come on. Come on. Oh, probably help if I pointed at the machine, not the screen. <laughs> but this, here in the early confusion, also Brownsville. Uh, this is further back. I'm going to guess. Uh, we're probably, uh, yeah, does it end up being the Mendota in this, <laughs> this vicinity? Um, but a lot of these buildings are going to disappear through the years. Get pointed to the machine. And this one, this is, I, I think this is going to be the approximate area of the Burley right now. But you can see what's happening here as you've got all of these. Uh, mines up above, you have mine tailings that are coming down. So there are then brown gulch slides. Well, when I first started, okay. yeah. um, when I first started researching silver plume and all of that, this is this is a great picture about 1886. It's going to be hard for you to see and equally hard for you to read George Rose writing here. <laughs> There'll be a test on it later. Um, <laughs> This is the Mendota. In the area over here, he indicates there was a cemetery with 25 burials. I'd never heard of that, but that's certainly possible. Uh, and some of the buildings. This is the building that is moved down from Brownville and becomes KP Hall. Um, the railroad here. <coughs> this is a, a slightly fuzzy blow up of that. But again, this is the Mendota. KP and other buildings here. Uh, you can see they're running um, track over to get to the train. Okay, so now we're back to back to Silver Plume a little bit. Well, maybe we'll go back to oh, back to Brownville. So I was studying all of this, and people said, "When was the Brownville slide?" Well. Um, 1889, 1892, 1895, uh, 1898, 1899, and 1912. <laughs> so what you have is just about every year between high water in the spring and snow and avalanche, you've got things that are coming down and they're gradually there wasn't one that wiped out the town. That, that's what I had heard through the years. And it was kind of everything wiped out a little more 
each time you had one of these slides. So if you were living in Brownville, you would start thinking that Silver Plume was perhaps a little nicer place to be hanging out, or at least a safer one. So by this point in time, you can see that it's a nice settled little village of Silver Plume. And you've got, see how this is growing here? I, I really should go in and attempt to figure out by decade how deep this is. This is the uh, Diamond Tunnel. Um, and up here, you're going to be looking at the Pelican. Dimes is here. Ashby over here. Hey, Chris, uh -huh. if you back up one slide, uh -huh. um, where is Brownville to orient everything? Over here. Yeah, okay. So yeah. It's, so this is going to be um, the Plume Saloon, is probably about here. <coughs> <laughs> it's Silver Bloom. We are in by saloons. No, it's, it's a, um, at which at this point in time was out of Osh's um, bowling alley and saloon. And Brown Oaks is the one that's further up. Yeah, it's kind of here, maybe even over this. This is going to be Cherokee Gulch here and Willahan. And the school isn't showing it. No, and the school, I don't believe, it, it may be here by this time, but I'm not sure that it is. But no, it would be off, off the edge. This one just cuts. It's a fun photo. Point at the machine. Oh, wait, wait. It works, so then, okay. Um, this is the Neshota Mill which was at the base of the Diamond Tunnel dump here, and right at the takeoff of the 730 Road. Again, you can see the, these beautiful stone buildings are built in the early 1890s. There's a real boom in both towns in 1890 because of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. You probably have all heard about the repeal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act in 1893, and everybody's saying that stopped everything. Well. It did, but it did, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act didn't come into being until 1890. But it did, it was a real pop for both towns. A lot of optimism. And this one I just like because it's an unusual angle. Um, that interstate highway now has taken out these sorts of buildings. But Water Street <coughs> is, still, is still there. So the school is here at this point. You can see down there, there's the school. And I just have to put in a couple of general shots. Cuz I mean, Denver liquor and cigars, it has to be on Main Street, right? <laughs> Here's the first schoolhouse in Silver Plume. Um, a tiny little one. This was George Rose saying 1884, 1885. That would probably make some sense. It's still there at this time, which would be later. Um, this school building burns down in 1893. Oops. But it meant that they built this one. And again, you have people <coughs> saying everything stopped in 1893. Well, this building was built in 1894. So the folks in Silver Plume hadn't read the stories that said, no, you're, <laughs> you're not here anymore. But a giant school, and look at the number of number of children that are here. It's a wonderful old building. Stop it. Um, the, the Windsor, of course, the building is still there. But the one that isn't there anymore is the National. And this is, so I-70 would be right about in here. Um, you can see the railroad track coming through here and they're selling views, so you've got tourists here. And this building right down here is the National Hotel. There it is. It's a rather spectacular place. Uh, National Hotel Silver Plume, owned and operated by parents of D.H. Bruce, who must have known uh, George Rowe. This is his handwriting. Uh, Mr. Young Mr. Bruce is down here. 
So silver plume, I'm guessing this to be around the turn of the century, possibly early 20th century, so they again hadn't read that everything had died. Um, a lot of people, I wouldn't be surprised if these folks, uh, they're in uniform and they, this may have been part of the dedication of the Silver Plume Church, um, the Catholic Church, because they marched down to Georgetown and met people and marched back up. So that wouldn't surprise me. This lovely building no longer there. And again, um, lots happening here. This is Main Street. Um, this is Town Hall, small town hall. <coughs> And this shot I love because um, this is Mr. Sevilla, and those of you who knew Josie Marshall, uh, that's her dad and her brother, thinking it's her brother Charles. Uh, good Italian family in Silverton. So along with, um, with rock slides, there are snow slides. Most of you have probably heard of the snow slide that came down Cherokee Gulch and killed 10 Italians. I believe this is from that particular snow slide. And if you go up to the cemetery today, this is from the dedication where they put in the, the stone marker that's still up there today. Isn't she wonderful? Sacred to the memory of the 10 Italians. Victims of an avalanche, February 12th, 1899. Now the next week, there was another avalanche on Brown Gulch that killed three Swedes. Three Swedes didn't get a marker, but there were. Uh, so 10 Italians, three Swedes. Uh, there were also five uh, additional uh, Swedes who were injured in that, that snow slide. And uh, you come back here, this is where you know, if you do presentations, you get to take personal privilege. And this is just fun because these are Josie's family. This is her brother, Phil. Um, this is her mom and dad. I think this is, is Pauline here? I think this is Josie. Because I think this is her sister, Mary. Yeah. Same age, okay. Uh, and her brother Charles and brother Santini. And this is her brother Charles with her dad later. So this has to be, um, it's just a wonderful picture. And I sang at his funeral. Wow. <laughs> this is 19, this is, yeah, yeah, this is right around World War One, I, I think. Um, Like Josie, I but she has a Josie sister. and then her sister was younger. Her sister, uh, actually, her sister was born in 1905, and Josie in 1909. Oh. Well, um, and then Phil, 1916. So actually, it almost has to be the girls yeah, and then the, right. the the boys there. Right. But so then there's a, there's another slide that people don't know much about, and that's 1921. And this comes down Snowdrift Gulch and comes, this is Big Town Hall today, so it's coming right down here. And this kills uh, Josie's brother, Charles. It was a pretty nasty deal. He was the only fatality another woman was hurt. And I have to put this in because it's, you know, because this is Cora Chapel, this is Verona's mom. And um, uh, I think this is, is this Verona? These are, this is uh, Dick and Tuck and Sherwood. And I believe that's Verona and Al isn't born yet, I think. Or I've got the, or that's Al. <coughs> Sorry if it's Al. I don't know if you're a boy or a girl, what can I say? 
And this one I just put in for the heck of it because, of course, you've heard of the, the, um, the Sunrise Peak Tramway. And I love the pictures. But this one is a fun story in that I had someone call me at my office in the county archives. And they said, you know, I've got the telescope from the, the top of the Sunrise Peak Tramway. Would you like it? Yeah. <laughs> well, he brought it down. It's a log. <laughs> it's, this is a photo prop. <laughs> it's at the museum. It's at the museum, yes. Because really, I, I just looked at this log and said, it's got to go to the museum. But I just, I love it. So that's there. Okay. What are we doing here? I'm kind of, I don't want to keep you guys here forever. And I just love this shot. Um, the names here, we've got, uh, this is a Mr. Rosenberg. This is Earl Williams. This guy's name is Spaghetti, I guess in <laughs> Italian, um, and, and others, but uh, they're ready for, I don't, I don't even know what, that's a great shot. About what year is that? Oh, what would you think, about 1920? Probably looks older than him. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not good at cars, so, um, but Earl Williams is looking, he's, he's looking like he's almost 20. Where's Earl? Yeah. Earl is here. So, yeah, 19. <laughs> 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 and Mining and Mills. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly because I think I really don't want to keep you here forever. But there are some really interesting early shots of Brown Gulch, and this is one of them. Um, so, this is Brown Gulch <laughs> before there's much up there. This is, I believe this is going to be the, the Pelican. Up the 730 road. And this is the 730 up at the top. Now those Brownville slides are going to take out all of this and take them down to the bottom of the gulch. But this is the 730 roads coming up in here. This is the Burley, and I think this is... This Burley Mill, I'm going to guess, is the one that was an Edison mill. Um, Edison's assistant, Mr. Ballantyne, was in Silver Plume, and he was trying to try new uh, procedures. And fun story, one of the, was it an Edison daughter who was staying at the Windsor when uh, they came up and said, you have to turn the light off, and she said, my dad invented these light bulbs, and she said, yeah, but he's not paying for them. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Ashby, which is on the far east end of town. This is the Payrock. Um, this is the Georgetown Loop Railroad here in Cemetery Hill. So this is pretty much underneath rights of way and all the rock and everything for I-70. That's the Payrock. This, so when all of this comes down to the bottom of the mountain, this is the 730. Uh, you can see what's about to happen here and why living in Brownville became dangerous. This is just a fun shot that shows all of the different uh, mines that are here, the terrible the Baltimore, which I want to get over and try and find. I think the right of way and the road itself has cut off the access now. This is 730 Gulch again. Ah, there's stuff coming down. If the upper right hand corner of that photo on the right photo is that the massive This is gonna be crowd uh, that the the uh, seven thirty is gonna be up here. Griffith Monument is Yeah, right. Griffith Monument would be about in here. Top, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah. I would say because I think that this notch is a little lower, I would think the road's coming in about here. But I could really be wrong. It's happened before. <laughs> and then a blow up of that one that shows the different mines and mills at that end. Silver Plume Mountain, yay, folks. Um, this was the terrible mining company building, uh, superintendent's building, which was down in the vicinity of what's now the uh, granite quarry. This is the Mendota, and one of the mills at the foot of the Mendota. This 
is the Watrous Mill, um, which is the south side of I-70. Um, this is one of Verona's pictures. She got pictures of her brother Dick standing there with Russian gentlemen. I don't know if they were, you know, find investors wherever you could find them. But that's the Watrous Mill. I think this is the upper workings of the terrible. This is again, there's the Mendota and Mill and some of the This is the terrible mill. It was big. This is um, this is Brownville. <coughs> You're above Brownville. You're looking. This has got to be still about 1893 because I'm assuming this is the Odd Fellows building that hasn't moved downtown yet. But it could be. There was another one there too. So more to learn on these silver plume research projects. This is the Baltimore, which is the far side of the terrible. Yeah. Did that last picture, the Methodist Church moved also? Yeah, it would have. Is it? Is that that little white? Where is it? Um, I think it's gone there? by now. I think okay. it's down here. Uh -huh. I don't think because it should have been right about here. Although I don't know what this building is. Is that just the shadow of the mountain in the dark? I think so. I think so. More. This is the Neshoda, um, so you're on the 730 road here. This is the Diamond Tunnel workings and the Neshoda and 730 road. This is a oh, 1905, 1910 building. That's the inside of it. I don't know who the gentleman is. This one's fun. Um, well, it's fun because we were down by the Mendota, and there was a mill. That, so the Jewel Mining Company, Jewel family had been in Silver Plume a long time. Jewel Mining Company sold their interest to some Midwesterners, and they came out and built a, uh, a mill here that would have been working the ores and the workings of the the Mendota, the Burley, and other ones about. I'm not sure that's what this is, but that mill was built by Abner Bradley. No, you don't know who Abner Bradley is, but I do. He was my grandfather. <laughs> and it's, so there are these two guys, and just just let me think that, yeah, this has got to be my grandpa. <laughs> uh, I had no idea that they were out here. I think they came out they threw money into the mountain, they lost money, they went home, and they never talked about it again. <laughs> but this is the west end of town, you can see the railroad grade. Yes. And one of the things that starts happening in the 20th century is mine tours. If you've heard people say, oh no, um, they wouldn't allow women in the mines, yeah they would, especially if they were paying admissions. <laughs> And I love this one. Because, look at this rig that they're taking into the Burley. Tarkington Groundhog Mine. He looks like a Buckley to me, but I'm not sure. And I put this one in. This is my last slide for the evening. Um, I enjoy this because you're looking at what really is going to be I-70 here coming through, but it's largely fenced off. I don't know if this is marshy. I have a feeling the CDOT engineers will know or tell us that. Um, this is Water Street over here. Anyway, I think that's it, guys. So there you go. If you can turn on a light, you can ask me questions that I don't know how to answer. How's that? Is the Bartlett that you talked about that was building um, lodging houses up in Silver Plume, is that connected with the, oh, I'm thinking of Bartlett. Uh, yep, different. I, yeah, I don't know much about him. I think he's an elderly gent. And we lose track of Kimberlin. I lose track of him. I've tried to find where he's buried, tried to find where he went. Uh, we hear that he went down to Custer County and, okay, West Cliff, Red Cliff, Silver Cliff, Rosita, all of those areas down there. but. He just sort of, you know, he was there, he, he did a lot, his wife died, and you just get the feeling at that point in time he really kind of loses interest on things. But, um, yeah, I don't know much about him. 
I have lots of questions. Uh -huh. When did you first discover that you had relatives out here? After you moved down here? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. That's crazy. No, it's totally crazy. I, I was working in the archives, and I got a package about this thing. And um, uh, the guy called me at home. I was like, well, <laughs> you know, that's a little pushy. Um, and he said, no, you're in it. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're related to this Joseph Love and these, or not Joseph, the other, the, this Love family. I said, there was a Love family here. And he said, really? And he hadn't, he didn't know what had happened to Joseph Love. And so, and Bob Orbach in Des Moines, who sent me that. So lo and behold, yeah, Joseph Love, he's buried down in Alvarado and his uh, nieces uh, early is down there. And then the Bradleys, I got by, uh, go figure, just word searching on coloradohistoricnewspapers.com. Thank you, Libby. <laughs> Thank you, library district. Uh, and I searched Bradley and came up with the fact that in 1907, uh, the Bradley's uh, son was coming out to visit his father, mother, and, uh, and brother, and I was like, that would be my grandfather. So he was out here for Christmas 1907. Okay. In Silver Bloom. I'm sure he went to the Methodist Church. <laughs> I have another question. Yes. Um, when I first moved out here, I went to a place called the Round House. Was that the area that Brownsville, or was that? Well, it would be, yeah. it's by the, by the Burley, and so that would have been considered Brownville. And that also burned down? Yeah. Yes. Oh, gosh. I think so. <laughs> yeah. I think, didn't Barbara work there? Barbara Leindecker? Yeah. Yes. Where did they quarry all the rocks? For the uh, that's at the, um, at the foot of Brown Gulch, and you can see it as you go up. So as you're driving the frontage road, or Water Street, through Silver Plume, then you make a left-hand turn to go under the road, and on the right-hand side, was the uh, granite quarry. It was started by William Hamill and then went to Fabian and is now part of the mountain project. It's, mm -hmm. Yes, so it's from now on. So yeah. yeah. Not kind of nice to own a granite quarry. Mm -hmm. well, and also well, and all those other things. Yeah. But, <laughs> and that's part of the reason that's fun to start pulling this together. But I, I really am looking forward to doing a little more research on Silver Plume, but it's tough. You just, the, the first newspaper in the county was here in Georgetown. It was the Colorado Miner, 1867. And they talk about the whole county, but as you might guess, they're going to talk mostly about Georgetown because that's where their office is. But you get occasional articles on Silver Plume and on Idaho Springs. Idaho Springs gets its first newspaper about 1880 and Silver Plume, 1881. Um, so you get more information, but that's a big decade to have light information and the property records are really, yeah. You know, so is it block five, the first block five, or block five, the second block five? Mm -hmm. But, Nick? The granite uh, for state capital came from Silver Plume? No, it, it's interesting. It is Silver Plume granite. Oh, However, okay. it did not come from Silver Plume. Oh, okay. this, was, it, this was fun. It took me a while to figure this one out. Silver Plume... The granite in silver plume is silver plume granite, but silver plume granite is also a type of granite. So they brought silver plume granite from uh, Western State. What, what's the town? Gunnison. Gunnison. Yes. Yeah. So they yeah. they did come up here to look at it and consider it, but with the amount they were going to have to haul out, they preferred doing that on a full gauge train compared to a narrow gauge going over that loop. Shirley. Well. One of my best stories is about the uh, Catholic Church in the 1884 fire. Right. That um, I think I got it from you. Could be. <laughs> um, that uh, when the fire started, the men were all out fighting the fire, right. and the women and children were in the Catholic Church praying. Yeah. And the wind shifted just before it got to the church. <laughs> and went the other way, and Pope Leo in Vatican City uh -huh. heard about it, and he declared that the miracle, miracle? of 1884, and he commissioned those two doors to be built by the, uh -huh. the uh -huh. um, uh -huh. priest, and... No, it, and now you didn't get that from me, but it certainly, it could be. Um, I always chuckle over, was it the ladies or was it the arrival of the fire equipment? <laughs> but it could have been both. Um, but in terms of, okay, so we need Sally. She's related to a saint. 
So you can, <laughs> right? You've got a Guinella saint. You know, we should try and figure out if if that if if the Pope did that. It could be. Well, um, he better the, because I'm not going to. No, don't that change story. it. So the <laughs> the side of the side of the Catholic Church is burned, as you could see in that one picture. So what they end up doing is turning it around right. and building a new front on it. So now it's a T-shaped building. Where it used to go like this, they, they turned it, and now it's a, that's fun. Okay. Well, oh, Jody, hi. I was going to give you a, t I was going to say, and do you know who Alice Feenan is? I bet you do. And I was also going to, I see Lily back there. Alice, uh, Alice Buckley um, would be an interesting person for your students. She had 14 children. And she was widowed in her mid thirties. Yeah, and she had fourteen children. She sits them down and um, tells them, "Okay, we're going to run this like a business, and who's going to do what, and everything else." But she's a fascinating woman, and there is an interview with her. Um, <laughs> so this is the article, and I, I couldn't pull it up as I was looking at this. Um, but there's an article where they interview her and she talks about coming to town and that the uh, Kimberlins were here and that they founded town. And so now I get to say, Grandma Buckley said, and that's the ultimate, if I can say <laughs> Grandma Buckley said. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Hi, Jody. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I was, um, what were you saying about the Catholic Church? Oh, the Cath so the Catholic Church uh, used to just be like this table here. You know, it was just a, a rectangular. And then the fire comes up and burns the east side of it. So they turn it around and then build a new front. So the portion that was burned is probably now about where the altar was. They turned the building, they turned the building around, yeah. But those two doors are the ones yes, that, were <laughs> that were well, and, and my friend, my friend Josie Marshall, my friend Josie would say, so there was a, Quite a bit of competition between the Irish uh, congregants and the Italian congregants. And so Josie <coughs> Sibelia, uh, Marshall, uh, Josie Sibelia said, and they were carved by Italian woodworkers. Oh. Uh, but it's named St. Patrick's Church. Yeah. So I'm not going there. <laughs> there is a wonderful article uh, that talks about the consecration of the church, and that's available. For any of you that like doing research, the fact that these newspapers are now all online makes it so easy. So you really can go out and search, search Silver Plume Catholic and you'll get all the articles that are on the, the Catholic Church. Or Jody, go out and search Buckley and you'll have 3,000 <laughs> entries. But I love the fact that those two young women stayed in touch for all those years. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, and that was, that was Maddie. Anybody else? I'll make things up. <laughs> it's, like I said, this is, it feels like the first step into the pool, and I want to get more information. And oh, but it, it is it's hard pulling it all together because it's just kind of iffy. Like, well, down here I can almost I can look at a picture and almost get it down to which month of which year, because there were a lot of photographs taken from Leavenworth coming down. Silver Plume, you do get some up above uh, Brooklyn Heights that come across town and that helps. But it doesn't help on the end of town, down by the Plume Saloon, Methodist Church, all of that. So more research to be done and any of you who want to, I will help you do it. <laughs> anyway. Yes. Uh, are the Silver Plume Methodist Church newspapers still available on the web? Yes, they're all, they're all there. The uh, Silver Plume Mining, something which only has one ep one issue. <laughs> <laughs> the Silver Plume Colorado in which starts 1881 and goes through like 86 and then the Silver Standard. The Silver Standard is a great deal of fun to read because it, the editor is, um, he would refer to himself as a socialist, um, different phrasing than the term socialist today. But he was one who would support labor unions whereas Mr. Randall and Georgetown sort of thought they were, well, you know. <laughs> He was more interested in the business community. Have you read anything mm -hmm. about Silver Plume 
anyone in Silver Plume being a part of the Ku Klux Klan? Oh I yes. wouldn't be. I'm, no, I'm not, no, I mean, I don't know yeah. really, but. Uh, <laughs> Oh, wow. Wow. They, well, certainly there were around here. And, uh, I know there's a picture um, that was in town and was going to go down to the State Historical Society. And I said, let me see it first, but it hasn't shown up yet. The first local clan. house that I lived in in Silver Plume is not there because the highway came right. through. A man named George Wilson. <laughs> When we bought the house, it was filled with everything that everything he owned. Oh. Wow. And there were indications that he was this, a yeah. <coughs> Well, it was, you know, it was big. I mean, the, it was big. You know, it was very big. the 20s. Yeah. 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 They used to burn crosses on Green Mountain. Yeah, on Green Mountain. But I, I haven't <laughs> heard of a cross burning here, but I wouldn't be totally surprised. Nick? When's next? When is the next devil March. take? Well, you see, so next March, it would be March 17th. But we do not have a speaker. And, you know, uh, we don't want to have it on St. Patrick's Day. So if the spirit moves somebody to do March 10th or March 24th, we will let you know. <laughs> I would complete. I, I'm tempted to do one on how to do local research. Which wouldn't be, good. yeah, okay, yeah. I'm seeing some nods, okay. Yeah. Because it wouldn't, it's not as much, but it would be fun with all the materials we've got now with, thank you, Library District, uh, mm -hmm. with those digitized papers, I can't tell, I mean, I had to read microfilm, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> take no, and type notes. Um, so there are, there's quite, there are quite a few there, but we'll see, I don't know. Um, so we don't know, and then April we're talking about Lily's kids, right? The elementary school kids who can come and do their presentations. They are fourth graders uh, study local history, or Colorado history. Colorado. Through, the lens of local. Through the lens of local history. And they do a wonderful job, so we're hoping to do that. Okay? And we do have, we do have Ray, Dr. Tulliford. From, from, uh, Fort Lewis. Oh, is he coming up? Yes. When? May. May. So we have a May program. Okay, we've got that one of those M months covered. All right, and I may take a break then. <laughs> anyway, awful lot of fun. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming.